Good morning and welcome to week nine of the Plymouth Church in Framingham's online worshiping experience. I'm Greg Morrissey. And I'm Will Tanner. And we are an open and affirming congregation in the United Church of Christ, which means whoever you are or wherever you are, whatever the size of your sanctuary or your screen, this worship service is for you. This love is for you. This community is for you. In these days when we are so isolated, this church is where and how and why we find community. We pray this hour will fill your cup and re-energize your faith. We hope that you will participate in our prayers and our hymns and take with you some good news for your day. To participate in our worship service, follow the link to the email in the live feed, uh, as well as on YouTube. You'll also find in our email, specially curated home-based faith workshop for you and for your family to do together at home. Facebook people, please like and share this stream with your family and friends. YouTube watchers, please subscribe to our channel. With the confidence of knowing that what we do separately is joined together by God into something beautifully connected, let us find the ground beneath our feet the breath within our bodies, and give our full hearts, minds, and souls, and strength to the love of God. Please, Please join, join us, us in the responsive, in the responsive call, call to worship. Behold, says the Holy One, I am lying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious. 
and whoever believes in my chosen one will be unshakable. The The steadfast steadfast love love of God God endures forever. forever. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. The steadfast steadfast love love of God God endures forever. forever. God will become a sanctuary, a stone one strikes against, a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. The The steadfast steadfast love of God God endures forever. forever. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We We bless bless you from the many many houses of the people of God. God God has has given given us us life and brought brought us together to to be be one one congregation. The steadfast love of God endures forever. We are a congregation of many voices, many languages, many expressions of faith. Some of us are traditional, finding strength in familiar words of collected wisdom from past generations. Some of us are progressive, finding inspiration from the innovation of today. Some of us are formal, some of us less so. Yet in every soul lives the joy of God, the love of our Savior Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. We are many members, but one body, strong and bold in our faith. This morning, from dozens of satellite locations, we are one church. So let us gather our hearts into one prayer, a prayer for ourselves and for the world. Will you join us in the unison prayer of invocation? Holy Holy God, God, enter enter into into the sanctuaries of our homes. homes. Join Join us in our worship, that our words may have power and our lives may find purpose. Rushing spirit, blow our war world. Upend our apathy with renewed conviction and compassion. Free us from the captivity of injustice and put us to work as servants of love and makers of peace. Amen. Good morning. This morning's scripture comes from John's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. These are the words of Jesus. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may also be. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas asked him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to my Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. 
From now on, you know him and have seen him. Hi, everybody. Since we can't meet on the front steps at church today, I thought we'd meet in my garden instead. Because what I want to talk about today are surprises. And anyone who gardens can tell you that gardens are full of surprises. One surprise that I had this year was finding out that in Massachusetts, lupin plants are perennials. I planted some last year, they did not do well, but they were the first thing to grow again this spring, and they look great. Another surprise for me in gardening this year were the bulbs that we planted on um, for Monday Thursday, back before Easter. I knew they would grow and grow strongly, and they have. I had no idea it would take them this long to bloom. I'm still waiting. So I want you to take a minute today and think about a time that you created a surprise for somebody else. Maybe it was even this morning for Mother's Day. Maybe you and your siblings and your dad got together and made breakfast for your mom in bed as a special surprise. See, what you're doing when you make a surprise for somebody is that you are moving a little bit ahead into the future. You're moving from this moment just a little farther down the road and making sure that the future is full of good and joyful things for somebody else when they have no idea that you're even doing it. Now, in today's scripture, Jesus tells the disciples, I am going ahead of you to my Father's house to create a place for you there, and then I will come back for you. Now, usually Christians like to read this text, this story about Jesus, at funerals because we understand Jesus saying that what he's doing is going ahead to heaven to create a place for us in heaven, and then he'll come back and when we die, bring us there. And I think Jesus did do that, but I also think he did more. And I think today he's talking about more. I think that Jesus is saying, I'm not just with you right now. I am also with you in the future. I am already in tomorrow, in next week, in next year, filling the future with love and good surprises just for you. Now, I don't know about you, but when the days are hard or sad or scary, something that happens to me is that I start to worry that all of those bad things are going to last forever. They're not just right now, they're forever. But in those times, it really helps me to remember that Jesus and God are already in that future. They are already in the tomorrow that I'm worrying about. No matter what happens today, no matter what happens next week, no matter what I might be worried about happening, I know for sure that Jesus is already in that future, is already there creating good and wonderful and joyful things just for me and for each of you too. The Bible likes to tell us all the time not to be afraid. Fear not, said the angels. And that is good, right? but it's also hard and it helps. It really does help to remember that God is already in the future doing those good things for us. When I have a hard time remembering that God is there, I like to close my eyes and imagine a place or a time that God has created just for me. God has filled it with all of my favorite things, the places I love, the people I love, the foods and the feelings. If God were creating a tomorrow just for me, I would like to imagine that it is full of flowers and growing things, that it is full of dogs and cuddles, that it's full of my favorite foods. God knows us inside and out and knows just how to set a place for us in God's house. And who knows, maybe tomorrow my day will be full of the things that I love. Or maybe Jesus will have set them a little bit farther out into the future. Maybe God just put them not quite yet. But I do know that God is there already in the future creating good things for me. Living with God on a journey of faith is a big adventure. Let's hold out our hands and say a closing prayer together. We'll say, 
gracious and loving God. We give you thanks today for stories about Jesus that help us remember that you are always with us, not just yesterday, not just right now, but also tomorrow and the day after that. That your loving us and making good things for us isn't just today, but is all days, and especially the days that are yet to be. Be with us this week. Help us to be kind and loving, keep us safe and healthy and strong, and bring us together again soon. Amen. The peace of Christ can come from surprising places. It can be an electric shock from God pulling you out of a bad mood with some good news. It can be a sudden moment of quiet stillness that comforts you. It can be standing in solidarity with the poor and oppressed because a peace without justice isn't true peace. It can be found in sharing your bread with the hungry, as James writes, if your neighbor lacks daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? The peace of Christ meets the need of the moment. It is the promise that whatever you face, you do not face it alone. It is the promise that you will have support, real, tangible, measurable, love to carry you through each day. The peace of Christ is the church in action, the ministry of Jesus in motion, and the love of God at work. The peace of Christ be with you. Will you pray with me? Holy God, send your spirit here as I preach, that these words might not belong to me, that they might be yours and serve your purpose. Send also your spirit out into every home and heart that your word may find root in willing souls. Amen. There are times when scripture feels vague and metaphorical, it's like super confusing and obtuse, and then there are times when it feels shockingly current. Do not be troubled, Jesus starts off. Oh, brother, I am trying. Believe in God, believe also in me, he continues. Mm. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places. You promise? Because this 700 square feet that I'm dwelling in now feels a little less than spacious lately. Now, I, I do not think for one minute that, that Jesus said those words in the year 32, knowing that in 2020, they would be reassurance for me. All the same. Thank you, Jesus. This is the season in the life of our church when we pay attention to how the disciples managed after Easter. When, when Jesus was around, there was a lot of learning and questioning, a lot of awe and amazement at what Jesus could do. There was a lot of following. Then Jesus handed over the baton, and the learners became teachers. And all that awe and amazement had to become courage and faith. The followers became leaders. Thomas asks his question, but it's also our question. Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus answers, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. First, I want to address that toxic theology that uses this one verse to suggest that only people who confess Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior get to go to heaven. That kind of exclusivity runs counter to the life and ministry of Jesus. Jesus did not close gates. He opened them. He didn't erect barriers. He tore them down. Now, now, Greg, I know you're all about to say this. The words are pretty clear. No one except... I get it. I get it. 
We are so trained to read these gospel words as if they were a transcription of a real conversation that took place. Even more so in the era of, of cell phone cameras and TikTok videos, we have this presumption that the Bible is a recording of actual events. The gospels are something else. They are testimonies of deeply devoted, devoted followers in the faith. None of the writers lived during the time of Jesus. They are not conveying what happened. They are communicating what is true. And they were communicating to people that they knew, to specific communities that they had in mind. Now, this is the beginning of the church when, when things were new, when not everyone knew who Jesus was or had even heard of Jesus. And so it's important to shape the message to resonate with your target audience. Not unlike what I'm trying to do right now. And, and just like no one thinks that this sermon is going to be excerpted and, and read in front of future churches 2,000 years from now, I am positive that, that John never could have imagined that his testimony would become so centrally important to us. The Gospel of John is making an impassioned pitch that Jesus is super important, but not as the destination. Jesus is not the end goal. Jesus is the methodology. Jesus is the way by which one finds connection and communion with God, with the creator of all things. So yeah, yeah. Jesus could be saying, you only get to know God if you pass through me. But he could just as easily be saying, and more likely if I'm honest, when you get to God, you will have passed through me. When you arrive at God, you will, will have traveled my path. It, and if you compare these, these two readings, these two interpretations against the Jesus that we know performed miracle after miracle and then, and then immediately instructed people, don't tell anybody. Keep quiet about this. Jesus was not one to boast or to put himself in the center. Now, I, I forget that sometimes. Uh, especially given that he died on the cross and there's that giant cross in the center uh, of the front wall of our sanctuary, just hanging up there. He's pretty front and center. And, and I know that when I'm praying, he's, he's pretty front and center in my heart also. But the cross, the first cross, was not center stage. That was the opposite. It was where outcasts went to be crucified. The, the cross was as far from center stage as you could possibly get. It, it's been said that the Christians can get really animated about the arrow and miss what it's pointing to. And this is important for us to confess often because we Christians have a, a, a pretty spotty history when it comes to how we treat outsiders. Heck, it's not even our history. It's happening right now. Christians who get overly zealous about Jesus forget that Jesus came not for the righteous, but for the sinner. Which brings us back to that question. How can we know the way? I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus answers. This sentence also has a, a little bit of a sharp edge to it that can easily cut. The repetitions of that article, the, make it feel singular and exclusive. The way, the truth, the life. And, and while there is definitely a bluntness to that the, I think we can all agree that if, if it was translated with a more squishy A, um, we would all be much less inspired. <laughs> a way, a truth, a life. Eh. But, but what if we took out the articles altogether? I am way. I am truth. I am life. Remember your Hebrew, the proper name of God is I am. I am who I am. I am becoming who I will become. 
you see what John is doing? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and through him all things came into being. So let's break each one down. The way. Now, this is something that in John's day, when John was writing the gospel, would be a completely known moniker. Everybody knew what John was talking about when he said the way. It was known and obvious. This is how they described the Jesus movement. They were followers of the way. So, so don't try to overthink this one. I, I know that for us, that phrase is strange and we don't use that anymore. We identify now as Christians. Remember, the first followers of Jesus were still Jewish. They were following their faith. And so followers of the way were, were a particular way in which they followed their Jewish faith, which is to say they weren't Sadducees or Pharisees. They were followers of the way. We identify now as Christians, as followers of Jesus. So, so the way starts to sound almost metaphorical, almost as, a, as, a, as a, an ethereal concept that one must sort of grasp at in the mist. But it's not a metaphor. And, and especially when we start with the way, we think, oh, the life and, and, and the truth, they must also be metaphors, sort of concepts that are wispy and, and hard to grasp. No, 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 these are very clear instructions. These are obvious words that are clear and known. Follow the way. Follow the way in which Jesus has taught us to be. The sum total of what Jesus taught and mentored. It is love and justice. It is service and sacrifice. It is compassion over dogmatics. It is the new covenant to love your neighbor as Jesus loved them. It is to be set apart by the world and from the world. By strange behaviors rooted in reconciliation, not revenge. In, in understanding and seeking to understand, not in competition, in strength through weakness, not weakness from strength. Truth. Again, don't overthink it. Truth, truth, as in the opposite of lying, as in the opposite of obfuscation and evasion. Truth, the full story, the whole story, the parts that make you look good, the parts that make you look not so. Now, if I think about this, what are, what are the things that make me trip up when it comes to truth? Well, the things that make me look stupid, like I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, the things that, that make me look foolish as though I'm not cool. The things that make me look bad because I have made mistakes and sometimes I'm selfish and sometimes I'm petty. The things that embarrass me. Because sometimes I make mistakes that hurt people, people I love. These are the things that trip me up and hold me back from saying the truth, from saying the whole truth. Number three, life. Again, don't overthink it. Does a choice lead to more life? More life for you, more life for others? Or not? Does a choice lead to more life for creation or not? I don't know about you, but just about everybody and everything in the world seems to be spinning out this week. As if a, a global pandemic wasn't enough. We have snowstorms in May, killer giant hornets, <laughs> and, and, and that's just what nature is throwing at us. The human headlines are just as much of a gut punch. And I'm, I'm tempted, I'm tempted, you know, to just, let's just stay in the first century. Let's just talk about Jesus and, and what he was doing and what he was talking about. Let's just, let's just focus on what he thought was good and right and wise for him and for his people. I'm, I'm tempted to ignore it all and just, just amen, we're done. Let's just, let's just go on. But I found in my own life, when I ignore what's happening out there, when I ignore reality, it just, it creates extra stress and anxiety. It's a, it's a cognitive dissonance that poisons my prayer life. It, it sours my relationships. 
So we have to look at it. We have to talk about it. As hard as this pandemic has been for so many of us, fearful of infection, balancing parenting and working, getting a little star crazy in our homes, wishing we could be back at church, be with family for birthdays and Mother's Day. Still, we cannot ignore or neglect the fact that as with most things in our country and in our world, the hardships fall greatest on people of color, on immigrants, on women, on the poor, on the homeless, on the least of these. As someone put it, we're not all in the same boat. <laughs> we're in the same storm. But some of us are large cruisers, and some of us are in small canoes. This week, Ahmad Arbery, a black man, was out jogging when a father and son, two white men, chased him and killed him. He was exercising jogging on a pathway away from his killers, and yet somehow they felt the need to pursue. The shameful immigration policies that have caged children are still in effect, which have left children dangerously exposed to coronavirus. And now under the guise of public health and safety, children are being deported without their parents, and immigrants are no longer being allowed into our country. Government help uh, and resources that, that are supposed to be used for local businesses and families are not being justly distributed. These so-called freedom protests, armed men storming public buildings, this is, this is not who we are as Americans. This is not who we are as Christians. This is not the way of Jesus. Now, please understand, I, I have compassion. I know that none of us are at our best when we are afraid. This is why we cling so desperately to the way, to truth, to life. I do not have the power to take this away from you, nor to absolve you from your part in it. I only have my most fervent hope that in prayer and in reflection, you will let your heart break. Do not ignore it. Face it. Let your heart break and thereby be readied for the work that is required. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus says. This is both a challenge and an obligation of our Christian faith and the reassurance that we need. For Jesus promises us that when we travel in this way, when we orient our choices to promote and protect life, to be honest and truthful, to be peacemakers and, and justice bringers, when we devote our lives to this, not when it's easy, not when it's convenient, but every moment of every day, when we stand in solidarity with those who are most exposed, most at risk, when we do God's work, Jesus will go with us and prepare a place for us, a home, with God, in God, and through God, all good things will come into being. Amen.
One of the things that I am loving about this time is the way we are sharing our writing and our resources and our wisdom. This morning, I read these words from the Reverend Margaret Weiss and found them particularly meaningful, and I think you will too. Reverend Reese Weitz writes, The church is not a place, it's a people. The church is not only a steeple above the tree line, streets and cars, rather it is a people proclaiming to the world that we are here for the work of healing and of justice. The church is not walls built upon stone held together by mortar, but rather person linked with person linked with person, all ages and genders and abilities, a community built on the foundation of faith and reason and love. The church is not just a set of doors open on Sunday morning, but the commitment day after day and moment after moment of our hearts creaking open the doors of welcome, the possibility of new experience and radical welcome. The church is not simply a building, a steeple, or a pew. The church is the gathering together of all people and experiences and fears and loves and hopes in our resilient hearts gathering however we can to say to the world, welcome, come in, lay down your heartache, and pick up hope and love. For the church is us, each and every one of us together, a beacon of hope to this world that so sorely needs it. Friends, we are the Plymouth Church in Framingham. Let us collect our prayers together and offer them to God. Let us pray. God, we are in a liminal space, one where chaos and disorder have confused our lives, yet one where we also find time to rest and receive your peace. We sit like the disciples behind locked doors and wait in fear, and when you appear, we are given a spirit of peace that only you can give. Hold us in your grace this morning, offering us the same word you offered to the frightened disciples on that first Easter evening so many years ago. We pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, using the words that he teaches us to pray. We say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This weekend marks an important anniversary. Five years ago today, Will was ordained into the Ministry of Word and Sacrament in the United Church of Christ. We want to take a few moments to give thanks for Will, his ministry, and the Holy Spirit who called him to our congregation. When the search committee met, they recorded their thoughts. Here are some of their first impressions of Will. I like that Will is imaginative, enthusiastic, and fun. He's not afraid to try new things and then evaluate them. Will believes that he's here to serve children and youth, support parents, and tend to our souls. I love a phrase from his sermon on World Communion Sunday. Each individual holds a piece of God. Each of us can act on that gift by loving one another as Christ loved us. I like his conviction that being a church member in the UCC is not a spectator sport. We all need to step up to the plate. We have the responsibility and privilege to decide how we will be church together. His sensitivity and caring for youth shines through his profile and in our interviews, along with his deep faith 
in loving God and a calling to share that love with others. Although we are not God, we can try to offer this unconditional, unearned, and freely given love to one another. I remember the first time I met Will, it was on a video chat. Who knew that that would be such a necessary skill for our partnership? I am a better pastor because of Will's faith, his love of God, his love of this church. Will, you ask the important questions. You keep us focused on God's call to be who we're meant to be, to create and renew the Church of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you for being you. Thank you, Will, for being our pastor. Thanks for being our pastor. Happy anniversary, Will. Thank you so much for being our pastor. Happy anniversary, Will. Thank you, Will, for all the gifts and talents that you have brought to Plymouth Church. Next week, we were supposed to gather in the parish hall for our May annual meeting. This is the time in the year, as prescribed by our bylaws, when the congregation would gather to discern the leadership and the direction of the church by electing volunteers to various boards and committees. A congregational meeting is not just any ordinary meeting. We do not seek to follow the will of the people by a way of a vote. We seek to follow the will of Christ, and this is the part that gives me chills, we seek to follow the will of Christ, which we believe can best be discerned when we all gather in one room and share our thoughts and opinions. Take that in. We do not believe that a single king or queen or pastor or priest can announce an answer to the whole church. We believe that God works with and through many people. Each of us is given a slice of understanding, of insight, of intuition. We believe that true power comes not from the top down, but from among the many. Well, obviously, next week we are not gathering in the parish hall. And we are not quite sure how to hold fast to our congregational tradition of meeting and gathering to discern Christ's will, especially in this time of physical distance. Do we do one giant Zoom call? Maybe mail out ballots to the whole church? We don't know. So we wait until such time as the answer becomes more clear. But next week, we are going to take some time in our worship to celebrate and lift up the spirit of our congregational heritage. Until then, in this time of offering our gifts to the church, let us give thanks for all the financial generosity that keeps the lights on and pays our amazing staff. But also, let us give thanks for the hours and hours of so many volunteers that make this congregation, this church, truly holy and inspiring. Thank you.
May the road rise to meet you. May the wind always be at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. And the rain fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again. May God hold you in the palm of God's hand. Amen. Amen. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. Probably like five seconds, right?